what we should do is tell people where they can get the best gear that's going to be the most useful for the, the pipeline and their career. That's what we should be talking about. That's what we should be talking about. So there's two ways to find this. And there, we've got, this is also a, a fun little announcement that we're going to have. So we're talking about attackly.com. So go over to attackly.com for the time being. You can use our code ones ready. You mm-hmm. could literally get every single piece of gear that you need from high volume mass to fins to watches to ropes, anything that you need for assessment selection, all four services, basically for anything that you could possibly need. Do you need a training rock? They have training rocks. Do you need a new set of rocket fins exactly like the ones that you're going to use, say, for instance, at a Marine Corps selection or an Air Force Special Warfare selection? They've got all of that. And then pretty soon, you're going to be able to buy that directly from onesready.com, which is the big announcement that we got coming. We're going to become your single shop partnered with Attackly, where you're going to be able to find all that training gear. So you'll be able to find podcasts and a reading list your gear, and all types of things straight through onesready.com. But for now, go over to attackleague.com, use our code onesready at checkout. You'll get a sweet discount and you'll get everything that you need right off the rip to get ready for the pipeline. Everything except for a physical preparedness program. Trent, where could they get a physical preparedness program for all selections? You know, I get a lot of questions about this. And one of the problems is, is people will ask me and I don't know them. I don't know their physical, you know, abilities and levels. But ask me what they should be doing. And I don't have the time to sit or down with you. Or the expertise. Yeah. Or the knowledge. So, I don't know. I'm, a, I'm basically a moron. I can't create a, <laughs> a personalized program for you that's going to set you up for success to not only get into the pipeline, but to yeah. get your funny hat at the end or whatever it is that you're trying to get. Yep. Uh, but do you know who does know and, and has the expertise? Kevin Edgerton, 18 Alpha Fitness. And Coach we can't Edge. recommend him enough. Like his success rate from everything that I've, I've paid attention to is off the charts. It's ridiculous it's how, how good it is. I'll tell you what it is. It's higher than the attrition rate at the selection course that you're going to. I can't, I don't, I don't know how to put a number on how successful coach edge is at getting people ready for whatever assessment selection. This is army, Navy, air force, Marines, first responder, FBI. It doesn't matter where you want to go work. Kevin can get you ready to go. As a matter of fact, I am about three fourths of the way through his BJJ kettlebell program right now. And lo and behold, I'm faster. I'm stronger. My BJJ has improved immensely. And it's because yeah, yeah, way better looking. Yeah. 100%. But Kevin's program is great, man. I just go on the app. I train blind. I I just show up to the gym. I open the app and Kevin has my entire program ready to go. And he interacts with me. You know, for instance, yesterday I had to like, I took the last like two rounds of a long circuit, right? It was a really long workout, but I was feeling super beat up. It's been a super tough week. And I was like, hey, you know, in the comments, I wrote the comment for myself. I just wrote, hey, you know, didn't do these la- or I did the last two, two rounds body weight. I didn't use any weight. Right away, something popped up on my app. I looked at it. It was Kevin telling me, hey, that's a good idea. Way to listen to your body. Get after it tomorrow. Like personalized coaching for what it, what it is that you want to do. Go to 18 Alpha Fitness. Use the code one ready. So the number one and the word ready. So one ready to get a sweet discount on any of his programs that are out there. But if you're trying to go into the Air Force Special Warfare Pipeline, trying to be an Army Green Beret or a Ranger, FBI, HRT, CIA, it doesn't matter. He can get you uh, He can get you prepared for that stuff. So go check him out, 18 Alpha Fitness. Use our code one ready at checkout. Speaking of BJJ, this podcast, we're going to talk to Jarek Fry. He's a Marine Corps veteran. He had crazy stories about being in the Sangin. But most importantly, He started Veteran Bushido Brotherhood, and his goal, his sole goal for this 501c3 nonprofit is to find a community for every single veteran like him that lost his way after he got out and had no idea how to continue service. So it's an amazing talk with Jarek. We love the the program that he's running. Veteran Bushido Brotherhood is awesome. So go check them out over at VeteranBushidoBrotherhood.com and on Instagram. But most importantly, we hope you enjoy this podcast with Jarek. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Ones Ready team. We, we have an awesome one for you this week. It's Trent and I. Obviously, you can see our faces and you know who we are. But in the team room this week, we've got Jarek Fry, Marine Corps veteran, and he's got an awesome project, the Veteran Bushido Brotherhood. And we're going to talk all about that today. Jarek, thanks for sitting down with us, man. We really appreciate it. How are you? Great, man. Uh, really appreciate you having me on the show. Um, you know, I, I'm just trying to get the word out here and, and you guys are helping. I, I really, uh, I really do appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely, man. No problem. And I have the world's best rash guard. I can't wait. So Jarek sent me a rash guard. I can't wait to get tapped out in that thing about 40 times because that's what happens when I go to jujitsu and, uh, you know, wearing the shirt today. So I, I really appreciate it. Jarek, why don't you tell our, uh, tell everybody out there a little bit about yourself, man? 
Yeah, so uh, my name is Jarek Fry. I'm 36. Uh, I'm from the Pittsburgh area. I just say Pittsburgh because nobody knows Pennsylvania. Um, I'm right. about 45 minutes outside of the city. Um, rural Pittsburgh, uh, blue collar. I always say that, like, you know, like the down heart, uh, like blue collar rural areas of Pennsylvania are just like gritty, tough people that just grind, put their head down and, um, you know, work their life away, to be honest. <laughs> um, yeah, yep. You get your lunch pail, you go to work and that's what you do. It's like we, we were joking, you know, when we first talked, you know, Northeast Ohio, nothing is given. Everything is earned. It's cold, snowy all the time. You just go to work, you grab your lunch pail and that's what you do. You were going to coal mine for 50 years and that's your life. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, it, exactly from Ohio, it's we take the coal and then made steel for how many years and that industrial, you know, era is still around here. So uh, I grew up like parents, both blue collar, both worked their whole life, grew up playing football, um, other sports, you know, kind of gritty and uh, didn't know what I was going to do in life. And so then when I was in my junior year, um, Decided I didn't want to go to college because I hated school. Um, hey, man. Military dudes. I like this guy <laughs> already. This is good. Yeah. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's why you're looking at two dudes that uh, have been in for, you know, 20 years plus and have no four year degrees. So uh, yeah. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, so did that, you know, and uh, my junior going to senior year after football practice one day, uh, you know, I was, I just had a calling out of nowhere to go join the Marine Corps. Um, I knew a little bit that my grandfather was a Marine, didn't really know much about it. He didn't talk about it. He's the Korean era Marine Corps. Um, so those dudes just, you know, don't talk about anything. Hate life. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. What, what, uh, what time frame was that? So what, what year were you kind of in high school? So, uh, I graduated 2005. Okay. Um, so okay. it was, that was like the summer of, that would have been the summer of 04. Yeah. So post 2001, you knew what you're getting into. This was not one of those things where it's like, oh, I'm going to go to the Marines and, you know, see the world and travel. You were like, I'm, I'm going to go fight in GWAT. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And uh, again, the whole hate for school. Uh, the year prior, I took my ASVAB during school to get out of two days of school. because <laughs> <laughs> There's a theme here. Ch yeah. yeah, dude, Chesty Puller somewhere right now is so effing proud of you, man. He is here in <laughs> this thing. He's like, all right, you took it. You took the ASVAB just to get out of school. You got to the Marines just to get out of school. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> this is this is very on brand. I, I love this. Um, so uh, I actually happened to score really high on this on the test. Um, and so when I went to the recruiter that day, drove my 86 Dodge Omni um, down to the recruiter and uh Went in and, uh, you know, he asked if I took an ASVAB and I showed up. He uh, pulled my scores immediately and he asked me what I wanted to do. Um, they do that whole thing where they put the couple things on the desk and you have to pick mm -hmm. what, you know, what's most important to you. And sure. uh, I just kept telling him I wanted to shoot guns. Like, I, I just want to go shoot guns. I, I want to go shoot machine guns or something like that. Well, I assume on all these pamphlets, there are no words because you guys can't read, right? So it's right. just pictures. It's, it's all in crayons. And, like, fingerprints. <laughs> <laughs> right, like, these just... aren't snacks you're supposed to look at the pictures <laughs> yeah. and, and make a decision <laughs> listen yeah. you you get the snacks later okay but just point <laughs> to the it's it's like it's like going to a restaurant where they don't have any of the, the menu items in english and you're just like uh number four and it's just a picture uh, there's yeah, a picture of a there's uh. a picture of a gun and jarek was like number two yeah, yeah. there were bullets and then like <laughs> like computers some wrenches i picked the bullets <laughs> 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 he kept trying to steer me to the to the wrenches and stuff because he was like, "Hey, you're actually kind of smart. Like, you walked into the Marine. Corps you should be a wing like, Marine. Yeah, you should yeah. be a mechanic. Yeah, you should do something that like will actually, you know, help you in life." And uh, I kept telling him, "No, no, I just want to shoot guns. Shut up. Like, send send me over to shoot some guns." So, uh, I mean, I honestly had no background. Didn't look into it. Didn't. I just knew that I wanted to go infantry. I didn't even know it was called infantry, to be honest. Um, nice. But so I just wanted to, you know, be in that trade. So uh, he actually kind of funny because I was 17 at the time. I was about to turn 18. So I made my parents sign like the early release. And the damn recruiter in front of my parents told them that I should pick a different job, that I wouldn't have a job <laughs> when I got up. This is the best recruiter of all time. This is the opposite of every other recruiter story. This guy is like grabbing you by the face, be like, listen. Do you, you know, he did everything short of doing what he should have done, which is like, just go to the Air Force. Just go across <laughs> the hall and go. You don't belong here, man. 
Yeah. So they, they uh, he like told my parents and I was like, you bastard. <laughs> but, uh, you know, kind of just hard and that like hard armed them into the fact that like, I was like, look, if you don't do it now, I'm going to have to do it later. And then my ship date's going to move. So, right. uh, you know, yeah. e either you sign me now for infantry or, you know, I'll just wait and then I'll be pissed at you because I got to wait all summer. Um, because at that time, like there was a big influx of Marines and they were pushing a lot of people through. That was really yeah. in the, I mean, in the, uh, upsizing. I was going to say that that was in the surge. So that was, uh, you know, after Fallujah, like Iraq was popping off and then, yeah. Yeah. So they were really getting about anybody in at that time. They were letting, you know, realistically anybody in that had legs and arms. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I, they really didn't want me to push into the infantry. So, uh, I did anyways, because what do they know? Yeah, right. Yeah. 17 year old Jarek knew what he wanted to do. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, well, can I can I ask like a serious question though? Because I was thinking about this the other day. Like, what, where do you think that itch comes from? Because I, I don't, I don't think we've ever sat down and like really nailed down. Like, where does that? Why did we all end up doing what we were doing? Because we all felt it from a pretty young age, and some of us ignored it for a while before we did it. But like, you just woke up one day and you're like, I want to go, like, take it to the enemy. You know what I mean? Like, where do where does that come from? I mean, to be a hundred percent honest, I think that. uh you know, it, I don't care if I offend people with it, uh, this sensitive nation that we're in, but I, I, I honestly feel like I've been pushed multiple times in my life by God, um, you know, 100%, because there are moments in my life, a few moments that like, for no reason, I was given an answer and I just followed it. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and that time, like when I joined the Marine Corps, I was literally sitting on my concrete steps on my back porch after football practice where we just got hazed for hours, you know, it was like 90 degrees, hundred percent humidity. And I was just sitting there staring off into nothing. And at that point I decided that I wasn't going to college, that I didn't want to go to work immediately. And the only other option was to join the Marine Corps now. So like how that happened, cause I didn't like, it wasn't in, in my headspace at that point. Right. And then I immediately got in my car and joined the Marine Corps. So like, it, why else would that happen? You know, right. and, and there was no question. There was no doubt. I just followed. Um, yeah. So well, that's a, such a crazy thing too. And, and by the way, you're not going to offend any, anybody with that statement. Like you're good, dude. <laughs> like you send that shit. So uh, it, it's just this crazy thing. And Trent and I have talked about it a lot of times. Trent and I have very fun conversations as we're like sharing hotel rooms and going to sleep. Trent's like, Aaron, do you think that there are aliens? And then we have a talk for 45 minutes when we should be sleeping. But you know, that, that calling, that push towards things, that's one of those things as I've grown a little bit more mature in life. You know, the people that the people that refuse to at least accept the fact that there is something bigger that moves us to do things right. Like they can call it whatever you want. Like if they're not ready to call it God yet, fine. But there is there is something that moves you that that speaks to us in a way that is completely clear. And you explained it greatly. You know what I mean? Like just in a moment of clarity without thinking about it, without ever being in that headspace, I, I, I feel the same way. You know, for me, military was never really, it was never an option. September 11th happened, you know, about, I went to sleep on September 11th. I woke up on September 12th and I was like, well, I know what I got to do. And I told my dad, I, you know, I initially told him too, I was like, I'm going to go to the Marine Corps um, because I know that I can ship out the fastest. And he was like, hey, they're taking special operators in all branches. Why don't you go check the Air Force out? And that's kind of how my Air Force story started. But it was the same exact thing. I woke up and I just knew. You, you know, and sometimes you just know that that's what you're supposed to do. You know, you don't know why it's, you know, it might be a calling. You don't know why it's there, but you know that it's a thing and you just inherently know that that is, that is a thing. And that's what brought you to the Marine Corps. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like with, without question. Um, and I, I also think that like in that realm, uh, not to get too far off, I think there are certain people that like hear, listen and act. And then there's a lot of people that like don't take that action. And then those are the people that are really lost in life because you're fighting that calling the entire time. Like something's pushing you and you're either afraid to make the decision. Um, you don't like the decision or, you know, whatever. You just don't listen. Um, you're too stubborn to listen. And then you end up in a position that you don't you're not comfortable. You don't you're never happy in life. You know, you're constantly fighting uphill battles. Um, I think that when you go with the flow and I have, you know, I, I generally have my whole life, um, my whole adult life, and it's always led me in the right position. So, 
Why not? Hell yeah. That's, That's why great. I call it the itch. Because if you don't scratch it, it'll just drive you nuts for the rest of your life. And you're going to be in your deathbed and you're just going to be like, well, crap. Yep. Yep, <laughs> I, I, hope that you, I hope that on your deathbed too, you're just like, well, crap. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> you, you, <laughs> the pair, you, uh, so I'm, I'm assuming you went in 0311. So 0311, is that what the MLS, what'd you do? No, so I was a machine gunner because I had a oh, little bit higher nice. GT score. I actually contracted <laughs> machine gunner. You know, I got a I, monkey. <laughs> I love, I love you have a higher GT score and that gets you the bigger weapon. Like that I is the most. I got a tattooed on my arm after. <laughs> I've never loved that anymore. So you you uh, you convince the parents, seventeen years old, and you're like, "Hey, I'm getting out of here. You know, I'm going down to Lejeune. You guys still go to Lejeune for basic, right? Or is um, it Cherry Paris Point? Just, or Paris Island? Island sorry. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So when Virginia and South Carolina. Yeah. What was it? Uh, what was it like when you got down there? Because I know it's like it's a big smash. You know, in the in the face. You know, the crucible that is the Marine Corps basic training. It's, it's the longest. It's the hardest. It's arguably the best. Everybody knows it. You get, you guys are better and everybody knows it. What was it like when you got to Marine Corps boot camp those first couple of days? Like, so you had the calling that put you there. Did you ever kind of like second guess yourself and be like, uh, maybe this wasn't for me? Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, yeah. 100 percent. Um, you know, it. And I've done that multiple times in life, too, that we're like, you're like, this is what I want to do. I have to do it. And then you get there and you're like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> okay. like, yeah. Wait a second. Like, can I, can what I did I do? Thing? Right. So I got, you know, first time flying, to be honest. I never flew because oh, the, wow. the furthest I traveled out of Pennsylvania was Ocean City, Maryland. We call in, in the Pittsburgh going, area. We going down the shore. Yeah, we call Ocean City, Maryland. That's like uh, <laughs> Pittsburgh East, you know. So every every single person, blue collar person, in Pennsylvania, going down the shore, baby. In Ocean City, Maryland. It's kind of funny. <laughs> we had a little technical difficulty with Jarek's kids turning the Wi-Fi router off, which is tight. But Jarek, we were talking about Marine Corps basic training and kind of like the shell shock of getting there and realizing, like you know, you may have bitten off a little bit more than than you can chew. Yeah, absolutely. So, like I said, it was the first time that I ever left Pennsylvania. Um, so we only ever like really went to um, Ocean City, Maryland, which is only mm -hmm. like five hours from here. That was the only place that I really had ever traveled outside of getting on a plane. So the Marine Corps, you know, you go down to the headquarters in Pittsburgh and they give you a ticket and they drop you off at the airport. And they're like, good luck. <laughs> and so um, fortunately enough for me, I actually had a, a battle buddy. So like I met up with this guy. Oh, became, nice. We became friends. Um, through the delayed entry program. And so his name was Brian Giesman. Um, still friends. He still actually lives up the road. Uh, that's what I was going to ask if you guys still like, if you guys were still friends and stuff, it's awesome that he still lives up there too. That's great. Oh yeah. Yeah. So he, uh, we, we go and it, he hadn't really traveled either. So it was both new for us, but at least, uh, you know, misery loves company. Right. So, Dude. I, uh, I tell this, I think I've told this story before, but when I went to airborne school, there was a kid, I will never forget there was a kid, he was an E2 or an E3 in the army. His last name was Forced, like F-O-R-S-T. And he was this country Georgia white kid. I did not put two and two together until our first jump day. Like we were there. I was just like, you know, I was an Air Force dork, you know, playing around at jump school. They, so they were asking people like, hey, uh, who's going to be the first to jump out of the plane? Like who's going to be in the door and that jumps out first? And they were kind of, you know, there's kind of like this back and forth amongst our 20 dudes in the stick or whatever. And we're like, oh, whatever. And they kind of asked the question, like, who, uh, who has, uh, who's never been on a plane? And I was like, surely everybody here. And this little kid Forrest raised his hand because he lived so close to Fort Benning. So he was an infantry dude. Uh -huh. So he, he was an 11 bang, bang. He lived so close to Fort Benning that he just took a bus to basic training. He had never been on a plane. So the first five times that he was on a plane, he jumped out of it. And they made him, they made him go in the door every single time. I thought like, that is like the coolest story of all time. Like the next time that he, he's like, and we're getting ready to leave jump school. And I think he was going to Germany or something. Like, I think he was going somewhere. He's like, well, man, the first five times I jumped out of it, I don't know what I'm going to do on this six hour plane flight. I've only been on 20 minute plane flights and I usually jump out of it. <laughs> I was just like forced. <laughs> you're going to be great. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, you're perfect. You're perfect, Forrest. You're going to be, you know what? I bet he was a machine gunner too, now that I think of it. Yeah, he's probably a sergeant major now or something. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah. 100%. What, yeah. <laughs> he's a sergeant major of the army over in Sakya or something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but so we show up, you know, we get on a plane. They, they send you down to Georgia. Um, I think it's Savannah, Georgia is where like the plane actually ends up taking you. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, there's like just a gathering point and they start gathering you. And this is your first sight of like a somewhat drill instructor. I don't think that they're actually drill instructors. I don't know if they're in training or in their off cycle, but like they have a guy with a drill hat on that collects you, mm-hmm. you know, and then you're like, oh man, this is kind of real. So they kind of collect all you jam you on a bus and it's like eerily quiet and it's, it's in the middle of the night. It's dark. Mm-hmm. They, they make sure they bring you in at night so that like you have zero clue, like like any aspiration. Like, I know where I'm at. Like, it's gone. I don't I don't know if we drove around for a day or it was an hour, like zero idea of, of the time, um, you know, total head game from there. And so they pull you on. And then like as you're pulling on base, they make everybody put their heads down. So like as they're getting up to the gate, they're like, everybody put your heads down. And you just have this guy yell at you. It's kind of for the first time he's yelling at you. You're like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, first of all, why? <laughs> like, God, forbid, God forbid you have a little maturity behind you. Like, you know, you've never been on a plane before. You've never done any of this. And you're just like, oh, I'll put my head down. There's there's a whole swath of people to be like, but why? Do, are you embarrassed to be seen with us? Uh, do you not want us to see that there's like actual things here on base? I have questions. Yeah. Yeah. But like at this point, you're just, they they've already shocked you. You know, you're because they didn't like sure. give you any heads up of what was going to happen at all. They were yeah. just like, hey, get on this, get on this plane and get to Georgia. Um, so now I'm on a bus and then with my head's down. And you're tired, you're already like real confused. Um, <laughs> and it just stops. And then you hear screaming, like, get off the bus, get off the bus, get off the bus. And you're like, what the fuck is happening? Like, what is, <laughs> what did I do? This is your first, like, what did I do? Uh, like, right. Did, how did I mess this up already? Oh, man. This is a bad choice. Just stop. You're like, Sergeant, did I do something wrong? Sar- like, yeah. I can we talk about t- this? Why are... <laughs> <laughs> did you think to tell the drill instructor to just calm down? No. That works with, it, you know. it works with it works. women really well. So if you're just like, God, just calm down, guy. What is what is the problem? <laughs> so, you know, I. I thought a lot of myself at that point, you know, I was like a football player and like a bigger guy and like tough. And then I immediately didn't think so much of myself. (laughs) Like they they did a really good job of like making sure I didn't think anything of myself. Really Um, shrink your britches, huh? Yeah. yeah, They had a, a, yeah. Real shrink your britches sort of mentality down there at Paris. (laughs) So you get off and it's like super hot, like, like, wall of water hot when you walk out like that like that southern humidity like bugs are sticking to your face as you're getting (laughs) off like it's a bad you know your shirt's automatically wet like you have chafing immediately for some reason like you didn't even do anything (laughs) (laughs) so so you know you get on the yellow footprints like the the notable, you know, like everybody's yeah. heard of the yellow footprints. So they put you, they literally put you on yellow footprints and it's just your initial, like, that's how they, they start forming you. Like they teach you how, what a formation looks like. And that's why it's there. So like they get you lined up because they know you're all too stupid to line up. In an actual <laughs> on your own. <laughs> so they have to have footprints drawn on the ground. Yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, you get there and they do that. And then like for, I don't even know, I think it was a week or so well immediately they, they shave your head mm-hmm. like in your clothes that you're wearing you're sticky you're gross they rip your hair off um there's like chunks of it still on uh and then they put you in this weird room with like i don't know a hundred other people with these small desks and it's so crammed that there's people sitting on the floor in between and somebody comes in yells at you, throws papers at you, you sign everything as fast as you can. And then when you're done signing, you put your head down until the next person comes in and yells at you. Um, this goes on for, I don't know. Ever. A month. Weeks. <laughs> <I'll be laughs> 
Maybe. I don't know how long I was there, but I, I assume it was about two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> I think we were in, I think we were in that room doing the paper signing thing for about a week and a half. Yeah. yeah zero idea. Uh, and then they put you up <laughs> in the birthing. They like start ripping people out. They call names. They go out. I was still stuck in there. Um, and then they put you up in a birthing with like these people and they put us. Uh, so we got our gear at this point. So it's in bags. We're still in our initial clothes. This has been mm-hmm. days. It, right. I mean, it, it's, it had to have been a couple of days. We're still in our clothes, like covered in hair still, like not in a good spot. Uh, and, and so they put you up against a wall and you sit on your sea bag. You like we're in birthings where there's racks, like bunk beds, and we weren't allowed to go on the bunk beds. We sat on our racks up against the walls. Other people were cycling through and staying in the racks. We were stuck on our walls, on our bags, like waiting for who knows what. I love this. This is a, it's, it's so hard to try to explain the military and anything. Like we all have stories like this. Be like, well, yeah, we just, there were these footprints and you stood on them and then we were there for like 16 hours and then some, there was a helmet and then we all threw rocks at the helmet and we're like, yeah, but why'd you do, why'd you do that? I'm like, what do you mean? Why did we did that? That was the only thing you could do. So we, we did that. Idiot. (laughs) Yeah. We sat there like kind of quietly, like kind of trying to assume what was going on. Um, and had zero idea and then finally like after a couple of days they tell you to shower and put on your initial uniform and then they like cart you off into your birthing where you're gonna remain for mm-hmm. this remainder of boot camp and you have your platoon now and th- that was actually like a sigh of relief but that first you know year and a half that i was sitting in that room uh <laughs> <laughs> There was a lot of like, what the hell did I do? Like, what did I sign up for? Why are they treating me like this? Why do I still have hair on me? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. You know, the, um, that's just, I remember like this whole time, like, wow, this was a really poor decision. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have made a mistake. Maybe but I should eventually, have joined the Air Force. They probably you should have joined it. I mean, that's actually, that's still true. Yeah. No matter how awesome this story gets, but so you, you finally, you, you know, they, they do a great job at all the basic trainings, you know, or ours is, you know, obviously the shortest, but the, the idea is the same, right? Like they take away those things of your individuality and, you know, where you're from and they build you back up into, you know, a rifle team, you know, to a a rifle team, to a squad, to a platoon, to a larger troop, to the force. And they get you to, to really assimilate into the culture and stuff. What was it like when you, when you graduated, when you got, um, you, you guys get pinned, you guys get Eagle globe and anchor. Do you not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what was it like for you when you got that Eagle Globe and Anchor? Yeah, I mean, it was the, the, the nicest thing is like when you complete the Crucible, which is like the, I think it's a three day event. Um, you're out there, you have like lim- limited food. It's basically like just if you survive, you graduate. <laughs> Right. Like if, if the smoke just, clears and you're still there, right. it's a, they, they don't even know how many, uh, how many pins they, they're like, all right, everybody count off. Ah, we lost eight. All right, crap. Yeah. Yeah, we lost a lot. Like we had uh that was back before like hazing was removed. And that was like right <laughs> nice. <before. laughs> so, nice. So, you know, I got punched in the face and spit on and, you know, treated really nice. I, I mean I deserved it. It it set me <laughs> to who I am now, but you were, I love hazing. <laughs> oh my god, it sounds like you're an abusive spouse. Like he's well, I mean, I, I guess I didn't have everything ready when the drill instructor wanted it. So I guess I really I made him mad. That's what the problem was. <laughs> I was in his <laughs> way. Like, of course, he hit me. <laughs> oh, my God. So like after the crucible, they like, you know, you're torn apart. Your feet are destroyed. You're like, it, but you survive. it. It's just a survival thing. Um, and then like, you know, you're done. As long as like something crazy doesn't happen, you get a staph infection or fall like something crazy. You graduated at that point. So like I believe like a day or two later, um, they start treating you like humans a little bit, which is cool. Mm -hmm. You know, they start calling you Marine, which is like a proud moment. You know, you're like, all right, like, yeah, I'm a Marine. I'm a a person again. Like I have an identity. You gave me an identity now. Like, thank you. Uh, Nice. But they so then. You get your Eagle Globe and Anchor ceremony, which is cool. And then, like, you know, the rest of that's just they do like the graduation, which is a cool thing. But you just get ready for it. But at that point, you're just ready to go. Like, yeah, they've got you so pumped up. And like 
they stuck the dog in the cage and poked it with a stick for three months. And now like, you're like, <laughs> I'm ready to be a Marine. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, did that came home for, I think it's like 10 days, uh, and then went to SOI mm-hmm. school of infantry, um, which is back down in Virginia. So that's like on the other side of Lejeune, mm-hmm. uh, Camp Geiger. It's just like a separated part of Camp Lejeune. So then SOI was another ball kicker, you know, um, that's when it, it, they just, it, a same thing. You kind of, they teach you basic, basic, basic skills, you know, and as long as you survive and you make the hikes and like you show that you're learning, um, you make it, mm-hmm. you know, you, you'll make it out the other side because they really need the numbers realistically. Right. Uh, Especially at that time too. Like, like we said, you know, we're in the middle of a surge and there's a three theater, you know, DTAC war going on. Like there's some other stuff going on. Like we can't really be holding people back for, you know, a couple of tests. So I I imagine that it was even, you know, there was that sense of urgency to get you out to the force to really go downrange and do what you're supposed to do, which is be a Marine, be a machine gunner, and then, you know, go take the fight to the enemy. So, so the first part is like the basic infantry stuff. And then the second part is like your actual, your last three weeks, you split up and you go to your actual job skill, which is cool. That was fun. Like when I got to go to the, the machine gunners course, you know, there's only like 12 of us. Um, and everybody there was like better. They were like the, the better guys, bigger, mm-hmm. a little who bit can stronger. Read? Yeah, who can, yeah, who can read? <laughs> can you read an instruction right. booklet? All right. Well, you're going to go over here. A lot of it was like learning the machine guns, right? Because we get a week for the each machine gun, um, 240, 50 cal, and then the Mark 19. Um, and you have to like, you have to take a skills test, a shooting test, and then you have to do like dis and ass under a certain time, which was mm-hmm. like just fun. You know, doing all that stuff was like, entertaining it was fun you're actually learning now shooting machine guns i mean who doesn't like shooting machine guns nobody you ever shot a machine gun on peyote guys like yeah. mustache. <laughs> come on man of course i love my job i've been wanting to go to the jungle ever since i saw that predator movie <laughs> so you know that that was a blast uh, i actually graduated like honor grad um from the machine gunner course like got top shooting top this and ass like i, I killed it there i just loved and excelled at that stuff I was always very mechanically inclined. So yeah. like, give me some. So Jared, learn. just for everybody out there, he's saying dis and ass, it's disassembly and assembly. It's taking the machine <laughs> gun apart and putting it back together. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. Jesus. It's I got to just let it lie. I wanted to see the comments. No, I, like, I know yeah, the comments are going to be what the comments are anyway. I don't get a <laughs> shit. <laughs> That's where we are. I was going to let it ride, you know? Yeah. So, Man, you, you get through there, you get you finally get qualified, you're ready to go, and you get to go do the thing, right? Like you hit that first assignment. How you know, wh- where was the first assignment and how much time did you spend before you actually went down range? So it was actually kind of crazy because when I was there um at IOC or in uh SOI, they were telling us they were like, You guys are going to war. Right. Like, uh, yeah. You yeah. like no bullshit, all of you within six months to maybe a year, you're all going to war. Be ready. Like there's no choice here now. Um, so they kept talking, you know, that that was when the battle of Fallujah was actually happening when I was mm-hmm. in an SOI. Wow. Um, so my first unit I went to was one eight. Uh, oh, was, wow. So they just, so like I went there in December. Mm-hmm. Fallujah was like two months prior. Right. Yeah. They were still uh, in, the, in the thick of it. Yeah. So like they were still like those dudes were still on leave from deployment Mm -hmm. and like, you know, so I came back with like these dudes that were just fresh out of the battle of Fallujah home on leave and then back. And I was like one of their fresh boots. um, Disgusting scenario. There is nothing worse than Jerry. Hi, I'm, I'm here to fight the war. And it's a bunch of grizzled guys that were just like pounding around in Fallujah during a, like a, post-apocalyptic hell space awesome good for you yes. buddy i'm sure i'm sure that they were super excited to guide and mentor you they were really excited about me being there. <laughs> they this really young guy is really me. gonna turn they, they valued, valued me as a person <laughs> <laughs> so so oh um, my goodness i mean it was very good like they they really focused you know there were some guys that really focused on training and they like really understood 
the how much it and how important it was to train us to be mm-hmm. honest um yeah. you know well because it's they, it's life or death and that's not hyperbole it, it really that it's life or death like it was yeah. their job to keep you alive there's multiple guys that in the platoon or in the battalion that are limping around with you know wounds from fallujah like not completely healed at that point um so it was very real what was going to happen you know and we were supposed we were slotted to go on a mu actually to mm-hmm. iraq um to actually we were supposed to go on a mu to ramadi is what it was supposed to be um, oh wow but so we did a mu work up so um couple within i think i got there in december we deployed uh 666 actually <laughs> oh tight good for you <laughs> yeah no. Yeah, June 6, 2006 was our deployment date for the Mew. And, and where'd you go? Um, so we actually floated over. Uh, we were like one of the first units in the Marine Corps for since the be- beginning of like 2001 to do a Mew mm-hmm. because they like canceled Mews. Mews were just flying over to Iraq or Iraq. Okay. So, right. um, so we actually did the whole Mew workup, which was kind of neat to like be on the boat and experience all that. Um, so we actually floated over and we did. I got to go to Iraq. Uh, um, where'd we go? We went to France, Italy, Cyprus, uh, UAE, did it, Jordan. Like we went to like 11 countries. It was actually pretty cool. Um, but so we were supposed to go over, hit a couple places, then go to Kuwait and then go in to help support 3-8 and Ramadi because that's when Ramadi was a shit show. Yeah, right. Two, that 2006, 2007, you're right in Jocko time frame. Yep. Yeah, so... We were supposed to go support that. Our actually, our sniper platoon actually ended up being pulled off the boat to go support that because we got pulled. So we actually ended up doing the evacuation of Lebanon. So oh, in wow. In 2006, when Lebanon blew up, yeah. um, we were on our way to Kuwait and they turned us around and sent us back to Lebanon. Um, kind of interesting history wise because 1 8 was the unit that got bombed in Lebanon in the 80s. Oh, yeah. The, the Kobar Towers, right? Or no, that- yeah, the, the Beirut. Uh, the, yeah, the Beirut, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kobar Towers yeah. is different. So, one eight was the unit that got bombed there, and so one eight went back and evacuated Lebanon, um, which was kind of interesting history wise. Hmm. So, yeah, um, we ended up evacuating that. That was, you know, we had ten thousand civilians standing on the shore. Lebanon was blowing up. We were sitting there on the smoke deck watching cities disappear. Um, it was pretty unreal. And, but so then because of that, we weren't able to push into Iraq. So we kind of just hit a couple more ports, spent some time in Kuwait and then came back. So like pretty chill, like pretty chill deployment as far as that goes, you know, in that time frame, my buddies from three, eight that I went to SOI with got shit on in Ramadi. You know? <laughs> yeah. Cause Ramadi was a terrible, terrible. So both of my brothers, so I, you know, I, people on the podcast know this, but I have three little brothers that are all in the army. Right. Um, before like two, there, there's two pilots now. My brother Danny just went over to fixed wing. My my younger brother Brian is still a 60 pilot, but they were both infantry dudes before they crossed over, before they went to flight school. And then my younger brother Kyle, he was an artillery man that just somehow pulled infantry duty. But all three of those dudes spent time like between 2006 and 2009 in like Tikrit, like in the Tikrit Triangle. So yeah. just everywhere in the just worst parts of Baghdad, Tikrit. Ramadi, like that's where they were during that time. I think, you know, my brother Brian, he actually got held over. He spent 18 months sitting around in the to crit triangle in the middle of Iraq. So not very cool, bro. Yeah. <laughs> so um after that, did that one. Kind of disappointed, honestly, because like all my buddies went to war and I didn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. To just to yeah. be honest. But I was super fortunate because we went there like all these nice places. I actually like got to hang out in Marseille and Cyprus, Rome, mm-hmm. uh, all those cool places. Not so, a bad gig. Right. But, but how bad. long was it before you actually like told your friends about that stuff? Because I would have just <laughs> been like, nah, nothing happened. Because you start bringing up like the nice places you went, they're going to be like, bro. Yeah. yeah. We didn't. Like there wasn't, there was a lot of that. Like 3 8 was right across from us, our barracks. Uh, so. You know, we didn't really talk about it much. <laughs> <laughs> for, yeah. for good reason. Yeah. Why well, open that conversation up? Right. Like my friends from 3-8 were shot. Like I had a few of them that like had gunshot wounds, came back and were still in like now hard chargers. Uh, like, 
I'm Cypress really nice. good at this and ass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, so it actually gave me a lot of time to study though. So we, cause we were on the boat, we studied a lot. We practiced a lot. Like we got really good with weapons. Um, like we were super, super skilled and dialed in with all of our skills and tactical and techniques and stuff. So that, that actually gave me some time for development before having to go overseas. So then, um, our, our unit then went like almost back to back to uh, Iraq. We went to Iraq in 2000, I think it was seven, like right when we got back, like I think eight months later, we deployed back to Iraq. We went to, uh, we were on the outskirts of Ramadi um, in the, like the great awakening period. So mm-hmm. pretty calm. We found some IDs. There were some firefights, some different stuff going on, but like n- nothing, you know, crazy, honestly. And then we went back to TQ in 2009, which was like, it was a waste, right? Like yeah. we were like one of the only units patrolling the whole area. We were in TQ, Ramadi, like that whole area. And then we went up to Al-Assad, uh, played a lot of water polo against the Navy SEALs and stuff. And, and Al-Assad, nice. that was good that for was you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, there was like a Cinnabon on Al-Assad at the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, I did that. And to be honest, I was pretty disappointed after that deployment because I hadn't done what I wanted to do, what I trained to do, what I was trying right, to do. Right. Um, so in Al-Assad, the recruiter or the, uh, or, uh, um, what did they call those? I can't remember those dudes. The guys that would like place us at different units, um, came there. Monitors. Oh, like the personnelists or whatever. Like yeah, they call them monitors. So Gunny Carlisle oh. came. And he was the O three monitor and I was a sergeant at the time because I got sergeant within like three years. Like I got meritorious sergeant. I was a squad leader, section leader, all that crap. Um, but so I went to him with my buddy, Kennel, who uh, we went through SOI together and I asked him who was the next unit going to Afghanistan. Cause I didn't like want to miss the war. Um, mm-hmm. I was honestly concerned about it. So one five or uh, three, five, sorry was scheduled to go on a terrible deployment. Like they were going to Sangin to try to take over Sangin. Um, what, what year was that? So that was 2000. So I was, that was like late 2009 uh-huh. going to 2010. So they deployed, yeah. they deployed 2010 to Sangin. Um, yeah. So Gunny so- Carlisle was actually <laughs> slotted to go there and to Kilo company. He was going to be the company guns. So he built, he grabbed every sergeant with, any combat experience with any like infantry experience, corporal sergeants. And he just plugged all of them into three, five. Yeah. Because the Sangin was awful for everybody that doesn't understand. Like the Sangin Valley in Afghanistan is notoriously bad guy country. So, you know, I've deployed there a couple of times. Anybody that's been anywhere near the Sangin will tell you that it is the wild west, except you don't know what side is what, and you're just, it's, it's constant. It's like a hurricane of gunfights. That's all you do. It's, yeah. It just is what it is in the southern part of Afghanistan. So we immediately signed up for that. We were like, we're going, let's go. <laughs> so we we both signed up to go over there together. Um, we got back from deployment. I think within a, uh, it was like two months or three months. There was like a time that we had to wait to drive over there to California because we were on the other coast. Um, so we jumped and jumped in our cars, drove out there, went to three five. But before that, we both decided um, that we wanted to be snipers because we oh, were good. Like, sick of our job. And we we're like, well, let's, let's go to Sangin and sling lead, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so the Gunny uh, Gunny Gavin, he was awesome. He was like a um, he's a Razorback, so he's went to like every sniper school. He was actually the chief instructor in Lejeune for a little while. Um, he was the platoon sergeant for one eight at the time for the sniper platoon. So he told us that he would train us and we could go through pre sniper and everything prior to going out there. So when we went out to, um, three, five, we'd be ready to go. Um, so when we got back from deployment, we just spent all of our time with him, went to pre sniper school, um, ran around, Hey, shot a bunch, but like, he's awesome. Uh, then we went out to, we, when we transferred out there, uh, they weren't really expecting us and they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Of course. Why would they? And, <laughs> We had 30 days of travel. We didn't take all 30 days and me and Kendall were like running and training, but like not full on. Like we were staying in shape, but not in doc training, I would say. Sure. Right. So 
You're in your off season form, not your on season form. Right. Everybody knows. That's, yeah. You're you're bulking. I got it. So so we show up and we were like, Yeah, we're supposed to go to the sniper platoon. And they were like, Sorry, don't don't know you. They were like, But we're <laughs> running an in doc on Friday. And it was like Monday we showed up. Oh good. They were like, So if you just get make it through the in doc, like you guys are studs, like you'll be good. And so we try to both, we sign up for the end doc, um, for this time, <laughs> like after 30 days of being off, um, hanging out in California and stuff. So <laughs> it's, it's uh, the recommended way to do it. That, yeah, that's, dude. that is a way that is, yeah. that is a technique. <laughs> Surprisingly, I was actually in, like, I was still in really good shape because I did maintain my, uh, my condition and stuff. And so I, uh, Started, we ran a PFT, like met four o'clock in the morning, rock run up the mountains and, you know, San Diego. Well, coming down one of the first mountains, I actually stepped in like a wadi and uh, destroyed my knee. Oh, cool. Uh, um, like ACL, LCL, both meniscus gone. Uh, <laughs> so, so that was cool. Um, <laughs> how, how long did it take you to recover from that? So I, it, like eight months later, uh, it took me eight months to get a surgery. I had the surgery Raider. Right I actually was in the hospital bed when three, five hit the ground in Sangin, uh, and found out that the first Marine got killed when I was recovering from surgery, which was super neat. Uh, and he was actually one of my guys from the machine gun section that like I was helping train because I was injured. Yeah. But like, so, uh, Lance Corporal Sparks, yeah, he was like one of the first dudes that got hit there. So yeah. he, uh, from that moment, I decided that however the, however I could do it, I was getting that Sangin. I was figuring it out. Like if I had to charter my own flight flight and get over there, I was going. So, um, you know, I did some extracurricular things to get my knee recovered as fast as possible. Um, mm -hmm. so I was I was back rock running in three months. Uh, nice. After my total knee rebuild. <laughs> Uh, good no big some, deal yeah, man did some crafty things uh because we used to have paper medical records back then and mm -hmm. so i was supposed to be on a separation uh which just happened to fall out of my folder oh wow oh, crazy no. it's yeah it's weird how that happens i don't, I don't know what you know I, yeah so jumped units a couple times to uh, you know make sure that things got cleared up and then when one five replaced three five and they had a uh, they had a big mass cash a couple of days. They lost their platoon sergeant, company commander, uh, and like six other dudes at one spot in one day for one platoon. Uh, oh wow! So I had done some funerals because I was working funerals for when three five was over there. I was taking guys home from three five. Uh, so I met some sergeant majors and stuff, and they like they were like, "Wow, you're a great marine. Anything you need, tell me." So when I saw the mass cast come through, I went to the sergeant major of the regiment and said that I wanted to go to Afghanistan. So within a week, I was in Afghanistan. Yeah, was pretty crazy. Um, turn around. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. And so I did. Uh, I was. I ended up being with Bravo Company. I was a squad leader, which never did that before. Eleven squad leader, um, but they needed just leadership. So I was in Sangin from <clears throat> from like July till i think it was october early october we left and what uh, year was that 2009 or was that 2010 2011 oh 2011 okay yeah, yeah. so like three five dude i was i was right down the road at bastion dude I was bastion yeah. leather neck shorebach during yeah. that uh, roughly that same fires. time <laughs> yeah yep so uh, it, yeah it was uh that was that was, that was rowdy i spent a lot of time with the marines out of hellman um out of out of bastion and Man, you guys, uh, you guys did some work, but it wasn't without cost and it wasn't without trauma. And, you know, kind of as you're telling your story here, a lot of these things that are kind of like kicking off my spidey senses is like, you know, you lose a friend, you have these, these terrible setbacks. You're kind of like looking for your place of belonging and, you know, you have an injury just out of nowhere that, that keeps you out of the fight. And then, you know, you're forced, even though you may not know those, those folks that you were working you know, those funerals for like, they're still Marines. They're still brothers in arms. Like they're still, you know, you still have a connection to those people. So as you're kind of going through these things, you're, you're sort of like, 
I, I've, I've referred to trauma as like a cup, right? Like you start filling that cup with more and more trauma. And I assume the saying in deployment wasn't the easiest. I'm sure that you took losses and I'm sure that there were bad things. Did you kind of like feel that, you know, creeping up? you know, in the back of your mind or was it just go, go, go all the time? I don't have time to think about this. I'm just going to press forward. Well, honestly, like the funeral duty, I felt like it was the only way I could serve those Marines that I should have been there with. Um, mm -hmm. So because of that, I had like, I had to serve, like I had a full leg brace thing on um, doing funerals and stuff and like talking to their families and talking to their parents and like, you know, 19 year old kids, trying to explain to their dad that like why they lost their kid. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, I, I, just, I mean, to be honest, just started drinking super heavily. I was drinking like, you know, a bottle a day cause it was the only way yeah. I could sleep. Um, yeah. so the only answer for me was to deploy and like do something. That was the only answer. So went over there and then, uh, you know, over there, I lost the only Marine that I ever lost Cor corporal Dutcher, Michael Dutcher, um, September 15th, 2011, uh, you know, he lost his life and he was one of the dudes in my squad. So, you know, that, that moment specifically, um, I didn't know why or how, but like that moment completely uttered my, uh, like changed my path. Um, and I knew that because he gave his life for us, that, like I have to do something bigger than I could ever imagine that I could do because what like what was his sacrifice for if i don't i can't be mediocre um because this person gave their life for me so yeah i mean it's, it's a lot of things right like you you feel guilt when you're not there for the guys and then like when people when we lose people it's like hey like we got to make it all mean something right so like the the uh, we focus a lot on like the negatives of 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 the you know trauma or whatever you want to call it and the losses but like there there is some pause there's there's push after that if you if you utilize all that stuff and push forward and then see what you can accomplish so like you, you said he's the only one you lost so like what happened after that like what did that push you and your your squad to do after that like i'm, I'm assuming you guys went out there and, and wrecked shop yeah i mean we went hunting um so but you know uh, sangin was wild west for sure i mean 100 yeah. percent uh you know like no other deployment like everybody ever like wanted we all like want that type of deployment until you're there <laughs> another situation like that you know um mm -hmm. but you know there were ieds everywhere we had to walk in ranger file everywhere we went like you get shot at and then blown up and you know multiple casualties we had like you know like i think there was over 100 uh, amputees on that deployment um, jesus you know it, it was rough it, it was a rough go but um i didn't expect to make it out of there to be honest, I just didn't, I didn't even think that I should or would or whatever. I didn't care. Um, and then, so leaving there was a big, like, now what the fuck do I do? Yeah. yeah. I was, you know? how, how did that, how did that affect the rest of your military career? Because a lot of times, you know, guys that'll go on those rotations, there was thousands of dudes that go on that rotation. You know, they had one thought about what war was and what the Marine Corps was or what service was. And then they get done and they get back home and they look around and they're like, I don't belong here. I thought I did, but it, it doesn't ruin them because I don't want to, I don't want to put it in a negative context, but we, we saw that too. We had a bunch of one assignment, two assignment, you know, even special operators that were like, okay, well, I went and had a really crappy deployment. We had guys that flew like 200 missions on deployment. Like they were just, you know, every single time that they landed, they would drop somebody off from a terrible scenario and the flag would go back up and they would just go right back out and, and it, it pushed them, you know, right out. So I, I kind of want to transition to, you know, you getting home and trying to figure out, you know, how to deal with all this stuff and how to, how to put all this stuff in its proper place. And then you, you end up finding yourself out of the Marine Corps. So how, how fast did that happen? Like how, how fast did you realize, like, I need to do something else? So I had I would have never got out, but I had a son on the way. And I always said that if I ever had a kid, I had to get out because I love deploying. I love being mm -hmm. in the field. I like, that's yeah. what I, I like being in the dirt with a gun. Um, I yeah. still feel like I, that's my, my best place to be. Um, but, but because I had a son, I knew that I had to, you know, it was beyond me anymore. It wasn't my decisions anymore. I had to do something and I had to get out of the, like out of the infantry. And if I couldn't be in the infantry, I didn't want to be in the military. Um, mm -hmm. so 
I immediately got back from deployment and within like, I think it was 30 days, I found orders to IOC. Well, it was actually TBS, the basic school in Quantico. So I transitioned okay. out there, went to IOC, um, infantry officer course, spent my, the raddest three years of my Marine Corps hanging out with all those, the cap hand selected captains, teaching all these infantry officers how to lead a platoon. Mm -hmm. Like, man, that it was like such a, I, I figured how can I have the biggest impact on the Marine Corps? And it's not affecting like SOI because you're, those guys are just surviving. The infantry officers are immediately out of IOC school and then they're in charge of 30 people. Yeah. So that's, that's where I figured I could have the biggest impact and like spread my knowledge and, and just, you know, really help the Marine Corps prior to leaving. Cause I felt like I needed to. So um, went to IOC, worked there for three years. Uh, fantastic. Taught all the Marine, every single infantry officer from, I think it was like 2011 to 2014 when I got out. You know, I affected every one of them. I taught every one. Of them. Um, so that was super cool to, to be able to do that. Um, and then so, I, and, it, and it was closer to Pennsylvania. That was mm -hmm. my initial idea is like back home. So then, yeah. uh, you know, I had my son. He was about two years old and I got out of the Marine Corps. So nice. End up at home. Well, yeah. And then the real work starts, man. So then, you know, you, you've lived this life and we, we try to separate the jobs, right? Like I constantly say that, you know, being, I, I am a PJ, right. But, and being a PJ defined me, but that's, that's a job, right? Like that's not who I am. When you start wrapping your ego up and all of those things, when you transition out and that's not there anymore, guys have guys and gals have a really hard time dealing with that like did you have a hard time like did you feel that you didn't belong anywhere like did you lose that sense of service or that sense of self because you, you know this was planned it wasn't like it just popped up on you you're like hey i i have a son i'm gonna focus on my family i've got you know a three-year time where i know it's coming and and that's the plan but i bet you still felt like you had something missing on that first day that you woke up and you were allowed to you know, God forbid you were allowed to not shave your face <laughs> on a Sunday yeah. for the first time in, you know, 10 years. Um, what was that like for you? So the weirdest thing was, to be honest, was about six months out when I didn't sign my reenlistment because I extended once just because mm -hmm. I, I loved what I was doing. I wasn't ready to get out. So I extended just to stay sure. there. I like was not ready. I didn't even prepare for it, to be honest, because I just I like when I do something, I dive into it. Um, so. When I didn't sign that reenlistment paper, everything changed. You know, that last six months, I realized how much the Marine Corps cared about me. Was it zero? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. Crazy, right? You know, how important I was and how cool I was and all these things. Like, I, I changed doctrine when I was there at IOC. I, like, rewrote, like, books for the entire Marine Corps. Like, we, we mm -hmm. did all these big things because we're at the headquarters. Um was on these councils and all this stuff. And then when I said I wasn't coming, I wasn't doing it anymore. I, my value showed. <laughs> wow. So, <clears throat> so, um, that was a, like kind of a sick feeling to be honest. Uh, and then actually getting out, you know, it was unreal getting out. It didn't feel, cause that was nine years later from joining to getting out. Mm -hmm. And, then I just show, I, you know, I show up in Pennsylvania with a box truck. I loaded my three bedroom house in a box truck and just drove it to Pennsylvania. And like, I was like, Hey guys, <laughs> I'm back. Hey, <laughs> my triumph, normal people, my hey. triumphant return to the steel city. What up Pittsburgh? Yep. So, uh, you know, throw all my shit in a, in a storage container and tried to then figure out what I was going to do. Cause I didn't prior. Um, wow. So planning so, is not really your, your thing. He's, he's more of an execution guy. He's decisions. more of an execution guy, Trent. You know, he's not much of a planner. He's, he's you know, he's like but, a dog chasing a car. He doesn't know what to do if he would catch it. I think that's one of the, the problems that people have, though, is, is when you're deployed, like you said, like you weren't expecting to make it out of there. Like your goal was to get there and to get into combat, like everything yeah. beyond that. Like if you start planning for that, all that does is cause anxiety and you're not focused at that life and death situation at hand. And so like we are programmed to deal with immediacy, you know, like, and that's what we gravitate towards. And that's what gives you the, <clears throat> you know, the big rush and all the other things that we we're going for. And you get out into the real world and you're like, there's no immediacy. Like I have a kid now, I have to do long-term planning and all these other things. And it's totally opposite of what we have been doing. And so when you find yourself on the other side of that, you know, immediate action, immediate results mindset, 
and then like you have like your whole life laid out ahead of you, it has to be a little bit terrifying. Oh, I mean, it was it was it was a very uh, it was a very lonely, hard time to be honest because I didn't know what I was gonna do. Um, I had like three months of terminal leave, which was cool. So like I had some a paycheck coming in for a, a paycheck while. at least, yeah, right. Uh, and the VA at home sucked. You know, shocker. I was to do my own paperwork. I was like, isn't this what you guys do? And they were like, yeah, but you can do it. So I didn't do that at all. I just, I, was like, <laughs> I just gave him a big middle finger. I was like, hey. if only somebody would have put you in a room in stinky clothes and told you to put your head down and you could have just signed some stuff. That would have yeah. been tight. Yeah. that's Come on. Like, <laughs> can you do me a favor here, guys? Do we not do this in all of life? You just give me stuff to sign and you figure everything out for me. No. Okay. Well. <laughs> so Lame. like living at my parents' house, get out. And now you know, the realization of like, what is my purpose? Like, what is my mission? Who is my community? Because I don't relate with anybody anymore. You're right. You know, I don't. The people that I went to high school with that I was trying to like talk to and stuff that like. Are- They're still doing the same dumb North, like middle West shit, man. They're going to the same bars and having the same conversations. And you're like, oh, yeah, this one time uh, when I watched a guy get his legs blown off and sang in. And then had to go out on patrol the next day. I guess that's sort of like you at your steel mill job. Yeah. Like you, you just don't even, it, you're, you feel like an alien in those, in those spaces. Yeah. So like, so like it, bro, I was just asking if you want a gravy on your fries. Like that's, <laughs> you're, you're telling me about Calm down, singing. <laughs> like what's going on? I asked if you wanted to sing Nickelback. I didn't ask you about the singing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So I like, I didn't, I like, I was trying to connect with these people. I was trying to find a place where I was at. Like, um, I think that my family and like, I didn't tell anybody what I really did or what I went through. Like they didn't know. I, I like literally, I went to the Marine Corps, didn't talk to anybody, showed back up nine years later and was like, I'm here to do life again, guys. (laughs) That's yeah. It took a little decade break, but here I am to continue on. So, um, it was, it was honestly like I just disappeared for nine years. And then now I'm trying to like figure out what people have been figuring out for nine years. Like they've been doing right. it for the, so, um, trying to figure it out, trying to manage it, uh, you know, it, drinking a decent amount, but like didn't have anybody to connect with, didn't have any community, didn't have anything. My buddy gave me a job plumbing. I was digging holes, like mm-hmm. waist deep and shit a lot of days, you know, sucks, shitty job. Uh, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> a lot of days rode home naked, you know, cause I didn't want to get my car with poop on me. Um, but it paid the bills trying to figure out like life at this point. And man, I was just struggling to find purpose. Uh, I was just like struggling to find like, like, is this it? This is why I did this. Like, this is why I went and served for nine years. Like what, what the fuck? Like, yeah, just couldn't figure it out. Um, and like in that time, divorced my, my wife, got rid of her because, you know, we had zero in common, uh, sure. at that point, you know, she did her thing when I deployed, I was deployed or in the field constantly. Cause I was so centered, focused on getting the mission done. Like I was, a, like, I got meritorious sergeant in three years. Like that doesn't happen in the Marine Corps. Right. Um, because I was just like mission, mission, mission. Um, so we completely grew apart, different people. So after living, like I got out for like a year and I was like, I don't even like you. I don't even know who you are, you know, realistically, like, I like, yeah, so man, I, I, I feel that like, I I feel that on a personal level, man. Like you start living these parallel, you you live in these parallel lines, right. And you never, you never like come back together. You're not doing things like, Hey, you're going to handle this stuff. I got to handle this stuff. And then after a couple of years, you don't even recognize the person that you're living with. Adult relationships are hard as it is. It's yeah. impossible to deal with an, an adult relationship in a, in a good way. Like it takes work every single day. You can't just ignore it and then just think, oh, it's going to be it's going to be fine. You know, and that's that's a story that we've heard so many times and that I tell myself, you know, yeah. it's, it's the same exact. It's it's essentially my story, you know. Yeah, I, I met the stereotype. Yeah, exactly. Walking stereotypes. Yeah. So with all this, you know, you're, you're just lost. You're kind of adrift into this place. And I, I really want to focus on 
what your answer was. So you, you didn't know it at the time, but you were building towards what you have now, which is the veteran Bushido brotherhood, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're, all my failures, man, all my failures and yeah. my love, like I was not being a good dad. I was not being a good human. I was not being a good employee. Like I wasn't doing anything crazy, mm -hmm. but I wasn't being positive, you know, but like you weren't I doing wasn't. anything good. You weren't, do, you weren't doing, you know, to, to get meritorious sergeant, to beg for a deployment to sing and to have the impacts that you had, you know, to essentially shape every single Marine officer for three years on your way out and write doctrine. Those are huge accomplishments. And when it's, it's not okay to be average, it's not okay to, to just be complacent. Like I, I laugh that, you know, how we talk about, you know, the Midwest and kind of Northeast Ohio and Pittsburgh and stuff. It's totally okay in those areas to just go to work, go punch a clock. You can be an alcoholic in your off time. As long as when you, you know, when it comes time to work the next day, you punch a clock, you put in your 10 hours, you, you take your little lunch pail and that's it. And, and it's okay to be an average person, but it wasn't okay for you. And you saw a need amongst the, the people and, you know, you saw it inside yourself and you were like, Hey, if I feel like this, there has to be other people. Um, you were a, a BJJ athlete. Obviously we talked about, you know, uh, when jujitsu, you know, came into your life, did it come into your life before you know, Bushido or, or was it kind of like at the same time or, or how did that, how did that work? So I couldn't stand plumbing anymore. I was like standing on a hillside in February. It was snowing. I was carrying tubes filled with shit up a hill. My buddy who was a Marine before too, who I was working with, he had a big beard and there's dip frozen in his beard. Cause it's just like nice. leaking. Out I'm over it. Mouth. Right. I was like, I'm over it, dude. I'm good here. I can't do this anymore. Like, <laughs> right. this, isn't it. this isn't what I did all this for. If you ever drink, like, dream of a scenario where you're like, God, I just wish I could go back to Afghanistan and yeah. go get into a firefight. And that was it for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, I mean, I can like, I can remember the smell and the, you know, the experience of it. And that's what I like cut it. Right. And that's when I was like, I have to make some change. So I actually started barbering immediately after that. Cause I always wanted to be a barber. I used to cut hair on deployment and stuff. So joined a barber shop. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the barber shop, what that did is it put me in a network of people Two of the other barbers started jujitsu, like within a couple of months of me starting there. Nice. They kept telling me to come. Uh, the, the head coach, Tommy Costa, um, little dude, like goofy, like messed up ears, like, of course, like, you know, like squatted posture, 150 pounds. He would always come in and get his hair cut. And uh, I always told the guys, I was like, I'll kick your ass. Like, I, I don't even train, but like, I will beat you. I guarantee it. That's that Marine in you. You got that, you got that tan McMap belt. You couldn't be stopped. Hey, I was a black guy. Belt. I was a black. <laughs> the black McMap belt. I love <laughs> it. I was a black belt. <laughs> oh, um, nice. But so they finally, I was playing rugby too. That was fun, but like, it was just fun. Um, so I got out and I, uh, they finally got me on the mats and I started one day and this, this actual Air Force dude, he's in the Air Force still. Um, he's a reservist and a nurse. Uh, nice. But, a nurse, please. Yeah. Say it right. <laughs> so he held me to the ground. He was like 170 pounds, held me to the ground. And I couldn't, I was 220 and like lifting and strong. And he held me on my back and kept going, work harder, work, work harder. <laughs> the disrespect, the absolute <laughs> Just disrespect. Just muscle your way out of it, buddy. Just I had muscle zero. <laughs> dude, I, to, this is, this is a lot. This is a lot like, you know, same sort of thing. Like when I was in Vegas, this had to be like 2000, I don't know, 2011 or something. Um, uh, there was a seer guy. His name was Eddie four. Eddie four is a, he ended up fighting MMA. He's a pretty good, uh, he had a pretty good record as an amateur, but I just say we used to roll on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We get together and do combatives. And the first time that they kind of invited me to the Tuesday session, I was like, okay, I'll take this MF. So same sort of thing. I was, I was easily like, I walk around about 205. If I'm really fit, I can get down to like 198. But typically I'm in, you know, if I'm in my off season form, I'll sit up at like 210. Man, I was like 205 at the time. This guy rode in Nogi, rode me knee on belly for about seven straight minutes. Nothing has made me more mad. No, I, I wanted to get up and just absolutely rage, but it, I was just like you. I was, I was like, okay, well, this is never going to happen again. This is never going to be a thing that, that I do. Yeah. That's the story, right? Is, is you go into jujitsu and I tell everybody you start jujitsu and somebody does that to you. 
and you mm-hmm. go sit in your car and cry a little bit. God and- forbid some dude, God forbid some brown belt little girl just twist you, fold your clothes while you're still wearing them and your strength means nothing. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, everybody in the room mistreated me, treated me poorly. <laughs> just disrespected. <laughs> yeah, just, and they were really nice about it. So that's, <laughs> that's even I'm telling you, you did great. And meanwhile, they're just like doing stupid stuff. Oh, it's great. I love wow, it. Wow, you're really strong, man. <laughs> uh, really strong, man. You taps so hard. Uh, so I'm like sitting in the car contemplating my life. Um, maybe I'll just drive off a bridge on the way home. But uh, so, you know, completely exhausted. And I was like, I never want somebody to do this to me again. Mm-hmm. I'm either never going to go to class again right. or I'm going to go to class till nobody can do this to me. And so I picked, you know, the, the better decision I say yeah. is, I trained then perfu- like as much as I could, um, even like changed my hours at work to train more, um, mm-hmm. just to, cause I was like, I got to get good at this. This is fun. This is, this is great. And my mental. So in about in under a year of me starting jujitsu, I was working at the barbershop. I then opened my own barbershop, found my wife, found faith, because of her, um, and then started the nonprofit uh, organization all within a year. Like, Jeez, that's crazy. Like, like, went from drinking constantly, like almost every day, mm-hmm. lifting, playing rugby, but like not positive, right? And stopped drinking so much, started competing at jujitsu, found my wife, opened a shop, and f- immediately started the Veteran Bushido Brotherhood. It's good. Like, well, the the problem with like your experiences in the military is you knew what you were capable of. You realized you knew what your potential was. And I think what happens a lot of times is like your unrealized potential, which maybe you didn't say it out loud or, you know, at the forefront of your brain, that stuff will crush you if yeah, you are yeah. not fulfilling your potential. And that's really what keeps you down. And I think as soon as you break that barrier and you start jumping into that potential arena and like doing what you do, jumping into things head first and going all in. As soon as that happens, like all that other, it's not crushing you anymore. Now you're, you're, you're reaching forward to what your, you know, your goals are, your potential is like that, that, um, what are we talking about in the beginning? You know, like your mission, like your, whatever it is that like, you should be listening to that you were ignoring and drowning with the alcohol. Like as soon as you turn that around and you, you start moving towards that objective, like boom, it all works out. Yeah. It's, it's crazy how everything falls into place when you listen to that calling and you start making actual steps to do what you know that you should do. So Jarek, I want you to man spend some time and tell us about, tell us about the Bushido brotherhood, right? Like I'm obviously a fan. The second that you and I were introduced on, on email, I was like, dude, I'm in for this. Uh, obviously well, because I'm a beat about it <laughs> constantly. I, I can't, I, I hit the group chat and I was just like, listen, like we got to have this guy on, like we got to find a way to, to get him out there. But you know, obviously we've got friends in the same space, Sam over at Reorg Charity. He sees the same thing for his veterans over at the Royal Marines, um, you know, that you do here stateside. And that's finding a community for every single veteran, whether it's BJJ, but you also go through through group fitness. And I just kind of wanted to talk, I, I want you to talk about, you know, the nonprofit and, and kind of your idea there, because I think it's righteous. Awesome. Yeah. So that, you know, this is my path. This is my mission now. I found it. Like I found my purpose again, um, which completely altered my life. Like my my mindset now is in a positive direction. So now I have a mission. Now I have a community. And so like it's I'm just propelling. Right. Like and I'm not going to stop until I either die or like, I mean, that's the only option actually is die. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) I like it. But um, so the veteran Bushido Brotherhood, uh, Basically, because of my experience as a veteran, like not having connection, not having purpose, not having healthy patterns, not having community. Um, and then the other organizations in the area, the VA and just different stuff, they never like did anything to actually alter somebody's life to like to, to be a spark and initiation for that change of life. Because we all need something when something dramatic happens, you need a spark to change it, whether it's a person or a thing or whatever it is. Um, we need something to get us in a positive direction because, uh, you know, you're either always on a negative path or a positive path. And like the small little micro decisions lead you in that direction. And it's just a snowball effect. Um, you know, each day is like that. 
You know, if you wake up in the morning, you wake up early, you work out, you drink some water uh, and you read a book, man, your day is going to be killer. But if you wake up in the morning and you eat a donut and you sit on your couch and watch TV, like you're probably going to have a shitty day. <laughs> it ain't that hard, everybody. Wake up, make your bed, go work out, get some sun on your face, touch some grass and go on. Right. So that's but it's the same with life, right? Those small little days lead up to your year, lead up to your life. Um, so the veteran pursuit of brotherhood is not like I don't think fitness will change your life. But I think it can be the initiation for the change in your life. Like you need that fire to start, you know, that spark to start the burn. So um, the Veteran Bushido Brotherhood is meant. So it's a three month scholarship. So I just I kind of identified with jujitsu specifically that it takes about three months to stop hating it. <laughs> right. A lot of times. No, um, you're totally right. Yeah. You you, you just literally like just. Core. Yeah. <laughs> you literally feel like I always talk about like, uh, you know, the scene in the Marvel movie where. uh Loki, like Doctor Strange puts him in the thing and then like Loki like pops up. He's like, I've been falling for 30 minutes. That's like your first two months in every single jujitsu gym is you have no idea what's happening. You think you start to figure something out and then you find out that that's wrong. And then like you just you're it's a washing machine. You're just getting just absolutely wrecked. So so with three months, uh, it gives you enough time, I think to fall in love with it. And then also the big thing is to connect in the community because inside of that three months, you're going to find some friends in the gym. It just happens when you suffer together, you know, like we know this from the military, when you suffer together, you, you develop bonds. Um, and those are going to be like the strongest bonds So suffering on the mat in a combat sport or any sort of group fitness will get that connection that you need. Um, and now, you know, most of the time, the people that are doing these group fitness, especially jujitsu, I found, the people are good. Like the people in these communities are like good people. They're business owners. They're like people that are successful because that's who it draws and it sticks. Um, You don't really get a whole lot of assholes that stick with jujitsu. They like weeds itself out. It Um, does. Yes. It's a self-selecting thing. Like there are some dickhead white belts, but there's not a whole lot of, no, not a whole lot of dudes make it to blue or purple or up the chain because you get humbled quickly all the time. So so because of that, you're inside of a community now and like you're going to start networking. You're going to start doing better at work. You're going to start taking care of your family better. And then you actually see the value in the group fitness because it's really hard for people to value something that they've never experienced. Right. Like yeah. like if I tell you something cost you five hundred dollars a month. But you've never done it before. How do you know it's worth it? Right it's very hard to like know it's worth it and then find the money to make it happen. So the the three month program is because I don't want to give veterans anything. I want to empower veterans to take charge of their own life. So with the three months and I give you a whole gear set, so you get a gi, rash guard, gloves, shorts, all that crap. Um, And then three months scholarship to this fitness program. And then, you know, at the end of the three months, it's on you to take over. Like, it's your turn to take over. And then I also ask all of the gyms that I partner with because I talk to them and, and have conversations with them, make sure they're good people, good gyms, because there are still some, you know, not great places out there. Sure. Yeah. Um, but so I asked them to, like, take accountability of you a little bit to make sure that, like, at the beginning, you're showing up. And if they're not showing up, they're at least contacting me so that I can reach out to the veteran and see if he's all right. See if maybe the gym sucks. Maybe it's not the right, right place. Maybe he needs to go do CrossFit or dance. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, do, go go to a Roomba class for all I care, but go. All right, Roomba, Zumba? I don't know. Whatever. Is that a thing? Yeah. But this is, I think this is a part, man, that I connected with the most. And this is, you know, we had, you know, Nick uh, Kumalatos came on our podcast and he had a, a real, you know, that a, he, got, he got a lot of shit for it and we did too. And quite frankly, I don't care because his message was was right. But your job as a disabled veteran or as somebody that has, you know, served in the, in the, in the service in any capacity, that's not your entire life. Like the, the fact that you, you're like, Hey, I'm going to get you three months. We're going to get you this community. I'm going to find a home for every single veteran in some sort of community, whether it's CrossFit gyms or BJJ, or I don't care, competitive dance, Pilates, who gives a shit. But at some point you have to take ownership of this thing. Like you, you, you having PTSD, you having a service related injury, that is not who you are. That is a diagnosis. That is a thing that you have. And I love that the entire idea behind veteran Bushido is that I'm going to get you there. I'm going to jumpstart this thing. I'm going to give you the spark. 
but it's on you to keep the fire going and to keep going down that path. And man, that is, that is empowerment. That is all of these woo woo words that I'm supposed to use, but that's what you're supposed to do as a sergeant. That's what you're supposed to do as an NCO. I don't hold your hand the entire time. I teach you how to do something. I give you the opportunity and then I watch you go succeed. And I think that's my favorite part about the Bushido program, man. Like 100%, the veteran Bushido brotherhood, it is not, you know, it's not like a, a, a government funded program where we're going to make you dependent on it the whole time. We're going to be like, Hey, here's the playbook. Now go, now you go and go do that. Man, I, I, I absolutely love that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and, I mean, cause it did it for me. Like I'm a living, it, the, the proof is in me. Like I had a major change in my life, like dramatic because of it. So like, I just feel like a lot of times after service, we stop serving, but like, why, why did you fight so hard when you were in country? It wasn't for the major mission. Like, I don't give a shit what you say. It right. was not for the mission. It was for the dude to your left and your right, period. So why wouldn't that be the same when you get out? Like, right. we should carry that on. A lot of dudes just don't. Um, but, like, I think that your service never ends. So, uh, and then the other big thing is that I always hashtag, and um, I've gotten a little bit of pushback from it, but I think it's funny, is I always say, fuck PTSD. Yeah. Be- because <laughs> the like the reason for that is like fuck labels um yeah like, whatever label people, america loves labels because labels are comfortable they give you an excuse to fail so like if i'm failing or i suck at life it's oh, i have ptsd or i have this or i have you know there are dudes that have one arm that are doing tough mutters yeah you know like i've seen them um, you know, there, this label and, and it's across society. It's not just veteran community, but like PTSD is like the big label that, you know, they put on all veterans and people, it's like an excuse to suck. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I think one of the things that happens is if, if, whether it's Muay Thai, BJJ or whatever, you'd like, it's a, it's a reinsertion back into reality. Right. And you have to like, it, like when you get ambushed, like you have a couple choices, you got to break contact or you assault through or you're going to assault through. And I think a lot of people, when they get out, they spend so much time and energy that they have because they're not getting their butt kicked in the gym every day or whatever, running away from these problems. And they have this, like the nice little label that allows them to do it. And and no one's telling them that that's not the best idea. But when you're doing something that forces you into that reality situation and gives you the energy or, or lack of energy to, to keep running away from these things and like, it just changes your mindset and you start to like confront your problems, right? When they start floating back up to the surface, yeah. I, I think it's just a mindset thing and, and, and being forced to confront your issues rather than keep running away from them and, and realizing that those labels are not healthy in any way. Like, you know, like, Oh, I'm a, I'm a tough guy. And then you go to a jujitsu gym or a Muay Thai gym and you realize like, Oh, but this is reality, right? Mm-hmm. Like I have PTSD, but what's the reality? The reality is I'm just running away from my problems. And if I, I was really honest with myself, if I confronted a lot of those, I could be, get to a 90% solution where I, I could get more, you know, better and healthier if I, if I just did it that way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, ima- and imagine that impact it's going to have on the people around you. And that's what people forget too. Like you're not dealing with this on your own. Your spouse is dealing with it. Your kids are yeah. dealing with it. Your friends are dealing with it. Your extended friend group is dealing with your issue. And for you to just throw your hands up, like when have we ever just thrown our hands up in the air and be like, well, I guess this is it. Like, the ambush is a great thing. Like, well, I guess we get ambushed. I guess we die today. No, we've never done that. It's never been a thing. It's never been a thing that you accept to do, you know? Yeah. So man, Jarek, I, I want you to put out everywhere where we can find you. So obviously veteran Bushido brotherhood over on Instagram, we're going to tag you in all the stuff and, and we'll get out there. And, um, you know, if, if you got a website, I know you said that you have a, another one of your big fitness events. So you do have in-person events where you bring everybody in. I know that's happening in July. So, you know, put that stuff out there, the where and the when, when is, uh, when is that coming up? Yep. So, uh, Galax, Virginia, it's a little hillbilly area in Virginia. There's actually a <laughs> nice. fitness, fi- fit, uh, fitness facility named after a, uh, a guy that died overseas. Um, his family started a fitness facility down there. It's called the Curtis Wright. It's a Galax, Virginia. So we're doing the first out of state. Um, we call them throwdowns. The first one's barbershop throwdown because it's in the barbershop parking lot. So we just call it that. Uh, but this isn't a, this is a community event. We do jujitsu. We usually raffle off some guns. There's beer, there's food, music, just a big community event to get as many people to see jujitsu as possible. Plus it's a pretty high end jujitsu competition. So that's July 1st in Gallup, Virginia. We're on smooth comp 
if you do jujitsu, you know, yeah. Comp. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I don't know when, and you just, just on the side, I don't know when everybody moved to smooth comp, but it was just like, I don't know how everybody in the nation all agreed at jujitsu gyms everywhere. They're like, nope, smooth comp is a thing now. Like literally every single person is on that thing. If so you've ever competed, you know what it is. So that's the independence throwdown. Um, you can, it's through the veteran Bushido brotherhood down there. Uh, September 30th is our big event. Uh, it's my annual event. It's a sixth one up here in Pennsylvania, um, Greensburg, Pennsylvania. It's uh, September 30th. We'll have, like live metal bands. I think we got like six bands this year. We're going to have pugil Hell sticks, yeah. maybe some boxing. We got jujitsu. We got all kinds of, it's going to be crazy this year. It's going to be a bonanza. <laughs> <laughs> I just like that word. But. <laughs> That's Bushido fantastic. bonanza. Bushido bonanza. Yeah. Yeah. So, Bushido um, palooza. <laughs> but so then on, uh, it's, we're on, uh, we have a website, veteranbushidobrotherhood.com. Um, you can always reach out to me at uh, Veteran Bushido Brotherhood at Gmail, uh, Instagram, Veteran Bushido Brotherhood. If you Google it, it's actually, uh, I've done a decent job somehow. I don't know with all the crayon eating, but uh, yeah. I, I, I figured out how to get my stuff out there. So if you just Google Veteran Bushido Brotherhood, you can you can find all my information. And, me. Yeah. So. and just for everybody out there, it's a 501c3. It's a non-for-profit organization. He's trying to make this thing nationwide to find every single veteran, a tribe and a community so that they can continue their service. And again, it's completely the onus is on the veteran, which, which I absolutely love. So if, if you can, I'm sure there's a donate button on this website. I'm sure there's a way that you could please consider it. It's a, it's a righteous organization. We love it. Jarek, we always close with some advice, man. So, you know, typically we add, you know, for our listeners out there that are, you know, trying to do something impossible, like become a special operator or go serve in the Marine Corps, do, do these things that they need that spark for. Usually that's who we're talking to. But, you know, if you had one piece of advice that you could give to the listeners out there about anything that you want to talk about, whether it's, you know, finding a tribe or BJJ or, you know, finding the motivation to start something that you think is impossible, man, what would you tell those folks? Man, my big thing is stop accepting your own excuses. Right. There's there's multiple times throughout your day or throughout your life that you're going to create an excuse and you know it. Anytime that you run into that situation, like maybe you don't want to do one more set on the Versa climber or yeah, you, you, know, gross. you want to skip jujitsu that day. You should go twice that day. You should do 10 more reps. Anytime that you find yourself and you give yourself that excuse, you should steer yourself in the opposite direction. Right. Go far beyond it. Um, punish yourself for giving yourself an excuse because then it'll break that habit across your whole life. It's fantastic. And for me, that's about to go do my programmed one hour on the Stairmaster, as is my Saturday custom before jujitsu. I hear you, bro. I hear you, man. Jarek, I want to say thanks for coming on, man. Everybody go check out Veteran Bushido Brotherhood on uh, across all platforms. Google it. Go check out Veteran Bushido Brotherhood dot com and make sure to follow along what Jarek's doing. Jarek, I appreciate your time and your story, man. Thanks so much for coming on with us here at the Ones Ready Team Room. Everybody follow us over on IG at onesready.com. We got a lot of stuff coming out in the future, but Jarek, man, thank you so much for your time, for your experience, for your wisdom, and most importantly, for what you're doing now with the Brotherhood, man. It's righteous, and I can't wait to get out to one of these live events and, uh, and get some roles in with you guys. So appreciate it, man. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both very much. I appreciate the time, man. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. man. All right, everybody else out there, train hard. Have a good one.